Richard, thank you so much for uh, doing this interview with us. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, so what can you tell us a little bit about Driven and your character, Roger? Well, Driven is a uh, creepy, comedic uh, journey. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess it falls in the horror comedy uh, genre, if you will, um, in which this character, Roger, who's, you know, a a trust fund and aloof guy finds himself having to track down and and destroy the remnants of a family curse. I don't want to give away too much because I don't want to spoil anything, but he ends up teaming up with character Emerson, played by Casey Dillard, who also wrote the screenplay, who's a you know, a driver, like an Uber-esque driver who picks him up and ends up becoming his, you know, right hand person through this one night of trying to hunt down and stop evil things from happening while also stumbling across many mishaps along the way. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so the movie, it, it had a, it was, it took a while to make. Have you been a part of it from the beginning, like in the very first stages of the process or did you come in a little later? I came in later. Uh, so Glenn Payne, who directed it and Casey Dillard, who I said stars, but also wrote it. They're, producing partners have been, and made a lot of indie projects over the years. We met uh, on the film festival circuit when I was uh, promoting uh, a short film that I had written and directed and we stayed in contact. And so over the years, they came up with this idea and you know, so they were involved in this process before I was ever informed of it. They, they had this idea of the story and they wrote it and they figured out how to shoot it and had a whole game plan. And then they reached out to me and said, hey, well, we have this. Would you like to be involved? And, and you know, I read the script. I knew I liked them as people. I knew I enjoyed their work as artists. And I read the script and thought the script was fantastic. Um, and so I, I jumped on board at that point. That's awesome. It always works when, when you have that good connection, too. Well, it, yeah, it helps tremendously, the fact that, I, that we already knew each other and liked each other. But, I mean, you know, the Fiesta Resistance was a well-written screenplay. Like, you know, she, she wrote a great screenplay and that was, I like a lot of people, but if the, <laughs> the screenplay ain't great, I'm not sure I want to hop in, hop on board, but they had such great material that it was a no brainer. That is true. Uh, speaking of the screenplay, was there like a moment or a scene, uh, like when you were reading it or while you were filming, where you're like, that's my favorite part. Like, I can't wait for fans to see this. Well, there's a couple of, of, of moments like that. You know, I think, one of the things that I thought was very clever is the execution. Look, you have indie films. Um, indie means independent, and in this case, it means truly independent. It really was a, a, a project they built from the ground up and funded from the ground up. And so there are limitations that come with that. But the, the story and the execution of the story never felt hindered by time or money because they had very creative ways of executing exactly what they wanted to see on screen. And there's a scene at a gas station. Um, that I thought was just super well done. Um, that is very specific to the way Glenn shot it. He had this very specific shot plan on how that was going to both be a character moment and also has some interesting story that I don't want to give away take place in that moment. And so that gas station scene to me was uh, kind of the one of the high water marks of the execution of production. And that, and and. To Glenn's credit, I didn't really understand what the hell he was doing because you know I didn't I didn't design the shots. I I'm just the hired gun, and he would say, "You're going to do this, this, and this, and you're going to go away, and you're going to come back." And I'm like, "Okay, man, you know, you tell me what to do. You're the director." And then when I saw it play out, I was like, "Ah, that's really clever. That's really well done." So you know, he had a design of keeping the car in the film the whole time. Every shot has the car involved, and he found really creative ways to do it. And to me, that that was the culmination of that concept of having the car and the story always intersect and the gas station scene to me was the was the ultimate moment for that. That's awesome. And I noticed that, you know, there's very few times you're out of that car. Uh, yeah. For the most part, you guys are in it the entire movie. There's maybe a few parts where you jump out. Um, what was it like? Because that was just a normal car, right? There was no, there was no illusions happening or anything. <laughs> no, we, no, we didn't have a faux car or a bunch of cars, <laughs> car with no roof, car with no door. Uh, it was Casey's car, um, and it was great because necessity is the mother of invention. So if you're going to be in a car the whole time and you're going to be that close to each other the whole time, 
as characters and as performers and as a crew, because don't forget, you got the sound team in there, you got the DP, you got Glenn leaning in with direction, um, you got lighting equipment. So a lot going on in that car all the time. Um, but that led to creative ways of shooting the scenes and it led to creative ways, uh, you know, it affected, I think, positively our performance choices in terms of blocking and, and how we how we executed certain sequences. Um, I, I just think it sort of made made it like, okay, this is what we got. This is how what we have to execute in this framework. How are we going to do it? And so it created a very team spirit element to the to the experience, and that we all sort of had to work together to be sure that we could create the story in the confines of this vehicle. And and they also had great what we call poor man's process worked up, which is the idea that the car is actually not moving, but they create the sensation of movement. Mm -hmm. And Grant had this old furniture warehouse we were in, and he built a very, if you just look at it from the outside, it looked like crazy people walking around with shopping carts with Christmas lights on them. But when you look at it on the screen, it looks like cars passing by and people behind you and the cars vibrating. I mean, it was such a well done poor man's process. And I've been on big budget projects that have poor man's process, so I know it's hard to do. And it can take a team of people you know, with a bunch of money, or in this case, it could take a team of people with a limited budget, and, I, and they achieved the same goal. And it was really, really impressive. See, I always find that interesting because I'm that person that likes to know what happens behind the scenes. Because then, when you're watching it, you can be like, "Oh, that's what he said." <laughs> yeah, well, and I think I think the I think if if people end up with the DVD of the movie, they, there's some behind the scenes footage that show the poor man's process. There's some still images of it, and it's just it's super fun to to see where how creative minds can get across their vision without, you know, without uh, sacrificing the, the story or the caliber of the shooting. I think Glenn and Casey did a great job of that. And then with uh, the process too, because, um, you know, you have your favorite moments and everything, but have you, what was like the most difficult thing to shoot? Was it part of that, like being in the car or was it like something else that maybe you wouldn't expect? I think it actually was some, it was also, it was freezing cold. So I'm gonna tell you right now, Tupelo gets freaking cold, which I didn't necessarily know before I went down to Mississippi. Um, and apparently we had the coldest window in Tupelo's history to shoot the movie. So we, that we had that going for us. So you factor that in, that makes things difficult outside. To me, one of the more challenging moments was a sequence where I'm just running around from the back of the house and, and have to interact with some some bad bad folks and you know get to the car in time and it was challenging in that we were sort of orchestrating that to try to exist as one shot without a bunch of edits in it um, but again with a sort of a smaller group of people to pull it off so there's a bunch of timing issues and a, a bit of stunt work and things that were involved with some dialogue that really made it uh, a challenge to get right. Once you got it right, you had it and you were good to go, but it, it just sort of took uh, several runs at it to get the dominoes to fall in the right way and a lot of adjustments, and a lot of conversations, and a lot of putting one's heads together, putting all of our heads together to be sure we could get every story point told in the very quick time frame we had to tell it in terms of the story. So I think that was one of the more challenging moments. And then you guys had like a lot of fun banter, especially in the car, like you guys are going off and there's a lot of funny things that came out of it. Uh, did Was that all scripted or did you ad lib anything or? No, I'm gonna give Casey uh, total credit for that. It's the, the, the back and forth is all on the page. Uh, there might be a moment here or there where she added something or I did something or we reversed uh, a line or moved a moment, but that was all discussed beforehand. There was no real improving throughout those scenes at all, because they're written very specifically at a very specific pace to tell a very specific story. In a way, I always told Casey, I said it felt very much like a play because a lot of the scenes, like you say, are longer mm -hmm. we're in the car having these conversations. And there's a lot of it that's felt very uh, theater-like to me. And I mean that as a compliment because theater relies on great characters and strong dialogue. And I think she created two very clear characters and had, you know, whip smart dialogue, you know, popping back between the two of them. And I thought that was super impressive. So no, that's all, that's all Casey. Yeah, there's some great moments. And then I was wondering, did anything get cut that like you really wished didn't? No, not that I, you know, not that I 
can't remember. Having seen the film, obviously I wasn't in the edit bay with Glenn when he put it all together. Um, but, you know, from shooting it and then me just kind of walking away from it for a while and then arriving to see the, uh, the finished product, I thought it, it felt like all the greatest hits were there. Um, all the moments and, and things that felt genuine when we were doing them. And the, you know, like I talked about, like the more difficult scenes where we're falling, we're getting up, we're doing this X, Y, and Z, you know, it has to be in a very syncopated fashion, you know, that all worked. So no, I felt like, I felt like he put it all in there. And if there is something that I love that he didn't put in there, now I don't want to know, because then I'll, now I'll <laughs> notice it. But no, I think, I think it was all great. That would make you more upset. You're like, oh, yeah. I exactly. <laughs> what was your favorite moment of the film? You watched it. What, what did you like? I... I really love the line um, with the incense. The incense, the gag was really one of my favorite things. This is she just kept pulling them out. Uh, was it that smells like Satan's anus? <laughs> yeah. That's, definitely my favorite. That's funny. That is a funny one. That, that, that was one of my favorite parts. <laughs> that, well, I mean, you you might not to, now we're going to go back on my one thing, but I think that might be the one improv moment that ended up <laughs> in the movie. Um, but uh, but the all, the whole through line of all the all the, uh, the 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 smells and the fragrances coming out was such a funny runner that Casey created. It was really great. Yeah, it made me think of um, just typically in a girl's car that center council like we always have something in there, <laughs> and for her to have for her to have like all those incense. Yeah, I was, that's hilarious because I know I have about three different air fresheners right now in my car. <laughs> so you get it. You're you're ready to. That's like where I was like connecting. I was like, yep. It's relating to you and you're ready to smell it to, to uh, spray it in the face of a stranger if he gets to lift oh. your car. Hey, you know, sometimes you get food in your car and it and it just smells for like a week straight and you're just like. Nothing, nothing like patchouli to block out the hamburger. I get it. <laughs> nothing like it. Nothing like it. <laughs> um, you talked about like the poor man's process. Um, so the one thing I love about indie films, you can feel the energy. You can feel the love behind it and the dedication. What's your favorite part about working on indie films? I think you, you kind of nailed it. Indie films require everybody working all the time to get the story told and get the movie made. It's not a go back to your trailer and we'll bring you out when you're ready to work, Mr. Spates. It is a, it is a team effort. You sign on to a movie like that because you love the movie and you think the movie has a chance to be something special and unique. And it's only going to be special and unique if everybody leaves it all in the field. They, they, they just dive in head first and stay in the water the whole time. And that's how that movie was. We were all in it together from the beginning. Obviously they were in it before I arrived and they were in it after I was gone. But for the shooting time I was there, all we did was work on that movie. It's, you know, we woke up, all went to set, started figuring out how to make things work, executed a plan, adjusted a plan, came up with ideas. You know, Casey and I would run lines in our downtime. I think our one day off, we met at a coffee shop to run scenes and run lines so we could be prepared for the next week's work. Um, it was all about doing everything. And Michael, the DP, was being creative constantly, trying to think of interesting ways to, to shoot the scene to make it visually stimulating and, and not monotonous and not repeat himself. And Glenn had a storyboard that looked like a comic book because it was, it was basically a graphic novel for the entire movie because he's a phenomenal pen and ink artist and had drawn up all these storyboards. So we were all just kind of all in it to win it from the get-go. And that's what makes indie films special and unique. And they kind of live and die by that. Like once you have a movie, if that movie works, it works because everybody worked their keister off to make sure it worked. And I think that's what's special and fun about indie, indie movies in general and this one in particular. Yeah, you could totally feel it too when you're watching it. You could just feel the energy of everything. That was great. And, and you get into those situations, you know, like I'm the new kid at school. I didn't know any of them. I knew them, you know, in passing socially, but I never worked with them. And you get there and you just hope that that's going to be what happens because you, you know, you want to do what your best, but you don't know what the tone or the spirit's going to be like from the rest of the group. And it was so great to see and feel and know that everybody was a hundred percent committed to doing whatever it took to tell this story the best way possible and to use all their skills to make that happen. And so, you know, you arrive, you're new, you don't know anybody, but then half a shoot day in, you realize, oh, this is gonna be a ride. This is gonna be a journey and I'm gonna enjoy every moment of this. This is gonna be great. We're all, we're all aimed at the same bullseye here. So let's, let's start shooting some arrows. Yeah, great. I have to ask, 
movie about a ride share. Have you ever had an odd experience inside of a ride share? Not quite yeah. like this one, but. Yeah, I've, I've had an odd experience in a ride share. I, yeah, I, I've used ride shares a lot. Um, <laughs> I've had a very angry driver who, and that, it, it kind of felt like the Christopher Walken scene in Annie Hall. Like, I, I felt like the driver was just going to take a sharp right turn into a bridge abutment as we were driving down the road because he was just so angry about the hand life had dealt him and he felt like this was a good time to discuss it and it was me and my cousin-in-law in the car and it was late and we we're riding back through los angeles and we're kind of texting each other like all right i will roll out of the car on my shoulder <laughs> and we screech us to a halt you then get out and let's run i mean you know i, I didn't know what the guy I didn't know the guy was coming unhinged in real time or if this was just his personality because obviously I had a, a brief amount of time to uh, to figure that out. So I, luckily he didn't come unhinged in real time right in front of me, but we did have that moment of like, crap, this is gonna go south potentially. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, ride shares, they're great, but also an experience. <laughs> I know, Definitely look, scary. for the most part, I love them. But um, I also feel like they are, hear that you can hear like every voice in my house this is, this is the benefit of doing home interviews um no i i, I kind of feel like ride shares are genius because in los angeles california there's there was not a lot of public transportation options uh until ride shares came along but at the same time yeah i don't know who's gonna be behind the wheel so you end up in some interesting conversations i would say majority of them have been wonderful um but there are the one or two where you're like oh huh hmm okay uh yeah, and I, I do have to ask, finally, Supernatural, it's coming to a close, very yeah. sad. Um, what was that experience like, and what would you miss most about filming that show? Supernatural has been, you know, in my life for 15 years, so um, having that show go away is going to be, you know, a real kick in the gut. Um, I feel very fortunate to have been a part of that show for as long as I've been a part of that show. I feel very fortunate to have not only gotten to play a cool character, but also then to direct the show and stay involved in different levels throughout the, the whole run of the series. Um, you know, I, I think what I say to a lot of fans and a lot of people who ask about the show wrapping up, I say the fact that we're bummed about it, that I'm bummed about it and that fans are bummed about it, speaks volumes to the caliber of the show. It speaks volumes to the quality the show has been able to maintain for 15 seasons. And the fact that the show is not being canceled unceremoniously or not, you know, jerked off the air without any clue, without being interrupted mid-season or without having one of the two main characters or three main characters quit. You have the original cast still firing on all cylinders, still doing great work, still delivering great TV, still having unique storylines and phenomenal moments on camera. It's all happening all up until the end and Supernatural's able to dictate their own destiny. So few shows can do that. And Supernatural, because of its strength and longevity and persistently good uh, execution, is able to, you know, dock itself in its own harbor at its own pace. And that's, that's a remarkable gift to the show and to those of us who worked on the show and to the fans who've enjoyed it for so long. It definitely feels like this huge body of work coming to close. It's just, ugh, you know, it hits. <laughs> it's massive. I mean, and, you know, the whole lockdown COVID uh, pandemic element has been a weird sort of twist in everybody's life for everything. But I was making, I was directing episode 18 out of 20. I was directing episode 18. And I finished shooting, and the day I flew out to come back to America, every production in Vancouver shut down. Mm. And so we've had this weird, not only is the show wrapping up, but how is the show gonna wrap up? Because we still have this, we still have these other elements that are still out there waiting to be shot and, and other storylines are waiting to be wrapped up. And so there's that kind of X factor that's been floating out there. It's made everything in flux and up in the air. But I mean, I guess that's just to be expected in life in general. And certainly when you have a show that's been on this air, been on the air for so long, there's no way to have the the exit be uh, 
not emotional. There's just no way. So, you know, it's going to be emotional. And, you know, people always say, what do you want to see happen at the end? And, and I never have an answer for that because whatever I think in my head is Richard Spade's opinion and really has no bearing on any other fan's opinion or any other writer's opinion. So I don't necessarily give an answer to that. But what I do say is that whatever they decide to do, a giant chunk of fans are going to freaking love it. And a giant chunk of fans are going to freaking hate it. And that, to me, is what's great about great drama, great television, is that we always want more. We always want something else. We always think, that's cool, but what if, or why didn't they, or couldn't they have, and not my guy, or not, oh, no, and shouldn't it have been that? And all those questions, all those conversations that will be triggered from the end of this series will keep it alive in the, uh, you know, ethos for a long time and i think it's going to speak well to the caliber of the show that it's a conversation you know because we're not all going to agree on how it should end but it's going to end and that's going to trigger a whole new set of you know debate and that's going to be awesome so true <laughs> so true with anything that goes on that long there's definitely going to be the contrast of opinions happening so twitter's going to be fun <laughs> oh yeah it's going to be it's going to be uh, <laughs> A relaxing spot for a while. It'll be so much fun. <laughs> so it's been about 20 years since the Band of Brothers. Um, anything about that experience that still sticks with you? Oh, everything about that experience still sticks with me. Um, Band of Brothers was a, I mean, crazy unique experience to take a bunch of young men who had never served in the military and, you know, task them with portraying some of the greatest men to ever go off and fight for freedom in this country's history. It, it was a, a remarkable experience. And I'm still as close to those guys as the day we wrapped shooting. I mean, we, we just had a couple of Zoom drink sessions since we've all been in lockdown. We have a barbecue every year at Bull Randleman's house, Michael Cutlets, who played Bull. We, we've had a barbecue every year since we wrapped that show on the week when we used to, when we finished boot camp, that we, that's when we had the, the barbecue. The only thing that stopped us this year was obviously the lockdown, but um, it's a unique group of people assembled to tell such an important story. I, I, I being involved in Band of Brothers changed how I perceive my country, my patriotism, myself in the scope of my country and my existence as a human on the planet. And honestly, I didn't have kids at the time, but I think it affected the way I parent and the way I view my, myself as a man and what I think manhood and patriotism and, and uh, commitment and dedication look like. You can't find a greater group of people who volunteered to fight on a faraway land. We take it for granted now because we have the internet and people travel and it's a thing. It wasn't a thing then. Nobody darted off to Europe. For these men of easy company, uh, in World War II, the first 25 times they got on an airplane was to jump out of it um, and to fight in a foreign land and to be separated from home and culture and country uh, for the greater good of humanity. And that's a, that's a tremendous, and these guys were fighting to sign up for this and then fighting to be in the 101st because it just sounded cooler and it got them a few bucks hazard pay and they wanted to be you know, they want to be the ones to, to bring home the victory. So, you know, I, I have so much respect for the men and women of the armed forces currently uh, and certainly in the past. Uh, and I, you know, I feel very fortunate to have gotten to pretend to be one of them in what I think is one of the greatest television events ever, ever crafted. And it, and it's great because of its content and because of the, the heart and importance of the story, which is true of the man who stepped up to do an extraordinary thing in an extraordinary time. So you still meet up with your platoon. Do you talk your own personal war stories with each other? Well, it's funny, we do like, we, the political landscape being so volatile as it is, we've had a lot of very political conversations of late, um, but we've also all watched each other get married, had kids. Um, very few of us were married at the time. Um, so we've, we've been to each other's weddings or we've been a part of the, the, the process. We've been a part of having kids, watching kids grow up. And so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some 
some conversations we've had that I will not repeat that have been, you know, us sort of sharing our own trials and tribulations of navigating life as as we've as we've gotten older and 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 stayed close. Um, and and politics and the world we're navigating now and the and the craziness of the pandemic and what life looks like now, what the new normal is going to be. We've been having all these conversations and it's been uh, it's been great to have that group to go back to because they've known us, they've known me and I've known them for so long. And it's so great to be able to have that as a reference point and to have the Band of Brothers guys as a touchstone um, has been a, a, an auxiliary, unexpected, wonderful gift that that series gave me. That's awesome. And that Finally, uh, you've directed episodes of Lucifer that are coming up. Uh, uh, how was the experience? Fantastic. I directed one episode in season four, and I have two episodes coming up that I, I directed in season five, which uh, drops August 21st, I believe, on Netflix. Um, and I, I just love that group of people. Um, cast and crew, you know, my TV directing experience Previous to that was was supernatural. Then I went off with Rob Benedict and made a comedy called Kings of Con. Um, but the first thing I've done that didn't have some sort of supernatural tie to it was Lucifer, and it was, you know, so great to be to be surrounded by people of like mind, like the supernatural group. Lovely cast, incredibly talented crew that loves doing what they do for a living and is fun to work with and creative and, you know, collaborative. Uh, it was just great. It was such a fun, you know, Tom Ellis is a, such a charming lead and Lauren German is such a charming co-lead and they're just, they they are great leaders for the group and the, the rest of the cast, they're all so great. They're just such nice people. Uh, and I've, I've gotten to tell some cool storylines with each and every one of them. And that, that's been a real blessing because you know, you you come in again as the new guy, and to be embraced and welcomed into that into that fold, and be able to jump in and and bring your ideas to the table, and you know, create more entertaining television, and 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 be proud of the work you're doing, and and impressed by the work they're doing. It's a it's a great experience. So I've I've absolutely loved my journey at Lucifer. Do you have a favorite episode that you directed? Can you? Uh, tell? That's you know, it's tough to say because I'm. You know, you always feel like, oh, your first one is your first one. And so there's a certain like loyalty to <laughs> numero uno. But uh, I, you know, I'm in season five, the two I got to do in season five were, were really, really, really fun for different reasons. Uh, you know, I do, I think one of my favorite of the three is in season five. I don't want to tell which one because I don't want to bias people, but um, season five generated out of the three I've directed probably a personal fave but I'm talking about by a almost a measurable amount because I've enjoyed doing all three of the stories and all three of the stories by the way were written by the same writer so I mean I, you know I can't offend her because she wrote all three of them so you know uh, Jen Amata wrote all three she co-wrote the last one with Julia but they she's been you know involved with, with me for every episode so I can't step on her toes if I have a favorite because she wrote them all so Lucifer seems to have his trials too. Can you tell us in one word uh, what that might be this upcoming season? In the past, it could have been love or family. <sighs> what would I say? <coughs> Excuse me. Lucifer's sort of journey is like a one word description of his journey for season five. Um, leadership. Good one. Leave it at that. <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> I don't want to like any show that has a sort of satanic through a through line. I don't want to upset anybody involved. You know what I mean? <laughs> so far, two out of the three TV shows I've uh, directed have a have a character named Lucifer. I clearly I, I I fall into a category with this whole thing. This is true. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out and talk to us. I uh, hope your quarantine's going well. <laughs> I hope your quarantine's going well. Stay Thank safe. You. Thank you. you too. I do. <laughs> I don't know if Las Vegas has a wear a mask thing, but we're yep. in California. We're all about wearing a mask. So. Yep. They just started it. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's the new couture item du jour. So 
Exactly. Match it with your outfit. <laughs> exactly. Fashion yourself up with a with a hip mask and, and roll across town. So true. Well, thank you again. And uh, I can't wait for fans to see Driven. I really can't. I, I appreciate I the interview. Already seen it, but... <laughs> I hope they already seen it since it's been out, but I hope they discover it and maybe watch it again. <laughs> well, I know that like in, in lockdown times, you know, one of the there's a lot that's negative, but one of the great things is catching up on or discovering new uh, entertainment, you know, elements. And I think there's no better time to sit and watch Driven. It's a, it's a fun movie. It's a fun ride. And I think people will really enjoy it. So thank you for interviewing me. Thank you for discussing the movie. And I hope the people uh, who haven't seen it, go check out Driven.